Data execution prevention is a type of vulnerability mitigation that prevents certain buffer overflow attacks. If you've seen my buffer overflow video, you'll remember that one of the main types of attacks we covered was a jump to buffer buffer overflow, in which we overwrote the return address to point back into our buffer to run some custom code that we wrote. I spoke a little bit about why this kind of buffer overflow is a lot more flexible than the jump to pre-existing function type of buffer overflow, because in this situation, we can write our own custom code to be run. This flavor of buffer overflow became very popular and was a problem for the security of many mainstream operating systems. Data execution prevention was Microsoft's answer to this problem in 2003. Technically, DEP is Microsoft's term for this specific security feature. It's also known by many other names, such as executable space protection or NXBit but I'm gonna use data execution prevention since that's how I learned it. What DEP does is it marks the entire stack as non-executable. This means that if we ever try to execute something in the stack, we'll get an access violation and the program will crash. As you can see, this really puts a wrench in our buffer overflow plans because we can no longer jump to any custom code that we have written in our buffer. To understand how natural DEP is as a solution, we need to zoom out a bit. When a program is executing, it gets a region of memory. This region is known as an address space. We'll discuss the importance of address spaces in a future video. All you need to know for now is that the address space is conceptually the memory that's allocated to the program by the operating system. It's like a workbench where all of the work has to take place. To carry out the actual program, a few things are needed. First, we'll need the actual program instructions. These are put in a code section of memory and marked as read-only and executable. Executable means that it's valid to run code from this memory. Then we'll need a stack, which I've introduced in previous videos. The stack holds all our local variables and some other runtime data. Before DEP, the stack was marked writable and executable. This meant that we could carry out our buffer overflow attack by writing to the buffer, then turn right around and execute the buffer. The big idea of data execution prevention is that the stack should not be executable. If we think about this for a second, we might ask, well, why was the stack executable in the first place? If it doesn't hold any code, it doesn't need to be executable. Why was it, why was it like this in the first place? To be honest, I don't really know. There are some things in computer science where the benefit of hindsight makes things seem ridiculous, but it's likely buffer overflows weren't even conceived when computers were first created. Also, it was only a little bit before DEP was publicized that computers even had the ability to do memory permissions checks in hardware. Before this, checking these permissions would be done in software and would incur a massive performance penalty. But having them done in hardware, they became essentially free from a performance standpoint, which could be part of the reason that schemes like DEP weren't adopted sooner. The impact of DEP was more than just protecting the stack. It set the general precedent that an area of memory should avoid being both writable and executable. This is known as the write ZOR execute policy, which is represented in symbols like this. ZOR denotes exclusive OR, which means either one or the other, but not both. So write ZOR execute means an area of memory can be either write or execute, but not both. Writes or execute as a policy tries to ensure that there are no other areas of memory that are writable and executable, because if there are, they could possibly experience the same trouble as a pre-DEP stack because an attacker could possibly write code to them, then execute that code right after. But while writes or execute is a policy, it's not a steadfast rule. There are occasions where we might want an area of memory to be both writable and executable. One common example is what's known as a just-in-time compiler, or JIT compiler. We may cover JIT compilers in another video, but all you have to know for now is that these compilers are responsible for generating code on the fly. It's common for a JIT compiler to have an area of memory that is writable and executable, so it can generate code and then run the newly generated code. This is actually quite similar to the mechanism used in buffer overflows that we've discussed, and thus, JITs must be written with care, as they pose a potential security hole due to their violation of the write ZOR execute policy. 
DEP is a simple memory protection mechanism, but a very effective one. If we look back at DEP, we can see a lot of trends in security that carry to the present day, such as the establishment of security policies and best practices, as well as the use of hardware to bolster execution security. While DEP takes care of the custom code variant of buffer overflows, it does nothing to stop buffer overflows that jump to pre-existing functions. But not to worry. In our next video, we'll talk about a mechanism that eradicates that type of buffer overflow as well. As always, thanks for watching.